We begin today by asking a simple question. Why did the spider cross the road? Get to the other side. Should be fairly obvious. He wanted to get to his website. It's funny, isn't it, how obvious some things seem after you hear them, after you see them? I mean, you hear it, you see it, all of a sudden it close. just makes sense. It seems so simple and straightforward. 2 Timothy 1 and 7, the word of the Lord reads, For God has not given us a spirit of fear, Amen. but of power and love yes. and a sound mind. Amen. Why did the spider cross the road? Well, obviously to get to his website. If God did not give us a spirit of fear, then who did? Pretty much only one choice left. Amen? Don't you love a multiple choice test where there's two answers and one of them has already been crossed off? Amen? It simplifies it for simple folks like us. If God did not give us the spirit of fear, the only other place that it could have come from is Satan and his kingdom. And there should be nothing of Satan or his kingdom in our life or in our thinking or the things that we do or that which we embrace. Hallelujah. Right. Amen. Right. Yes. God has not given us the spirit of fear. Thank you. So why do we see so many Christians so embracing fear? There should be absolutely no place for fear in our lives. Amen. If we are truly walking in faith, not doubting, not wavering, truly embracing the things of God, there should be no fear. Literally, fear should be completely absent in our lives. We should live, live absolutely absent of fear. Mm -hmm. not, not just where it's a confession, but where it's a reality. Because I don't know about you, but I know when I'm kidding myself. Do you know when you're kidding yourself? Do you know when you're saying something because you know you're supposed to be saying it? Or you're saying something because you want to believe it? Or you're trying to believe it? Or, or it's, you know it's what you're supposed to believe, but you know in your heart, and I'm kind of kidding myself. <laughs> I mean, we know in, intuitively that we're not supposed to live in fear as Christians. And, and oftentimes we say that we're not. But the moment a challenge comes, what's the first thing that comes up? Fear. The moment a decision needs to be made, be made, we need to make a decision, and we start with that thinking process that says, well, I could do this, but what if? I could do that, but what if? Those what if statements are rife with fear. And, and, and I know we don't always think about it this way, but maybe we should. We should start really looking at our decision-making models, our decision-making process. The questions we're asking ourselves. Now look, I, I, I'll be completely straight with you. It's, we want to live a life absent of fear. And I know some of you right now, you're, you're hearing that, you're processing, you're going, well, yeah, of course, I agree with that. You know, in, in, in most things, I, I'm going to be absent of fear, but there are some areas where I just need to be, consider fear. You know, in, in some of my decisions, it has a place. The scripture says, God has not given us the spirit of fear. So it only comes from one other place. It comes from the kingdom of darkness. It comes from the kingdom of Satan. Which means that we're saying, effectively, if you make that statement, that in some way, shape, or form, you need to incorporate the kingdom of darkness into your decision making. If at any point in time you say, well, you know, I, 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 there, there needs to be a little bit of fear in some of the decisions that I make, or I need to consider, you know, what could happen fearfully if I do this or that or the other, you know, that, that would be the reasonable thing to do. The problem with that is that means that we have incorporated some of that demonic thinking, some of that kingdom of darkness. We have brought fear in, and fear is not of the Lord. Now... Granted, there is a place for wisdom in our decision making. Okay, um, I, I am suggesting to you this morning in the spirit that we should be extremely bold. 
We should be extremely confident yes. in our decision making. We should not make decisions and say, well, I'm thinking about doing this, but what if? Mm -hmm. I'm thinking about teaching a new Sunday school class, or I'm thinking about teaching a Sunday school class for the first time, but what if somebody asks me a question? I don't know. Mm -hmm. You just entered a fear-based decision-making mode. What if somebody asks me a question? I don't Well, that's fear. Faith says, even if somebody asks me a question, I don't know, God will have to give the answer. Amen. I'll trust God for it. And, and so there comes this, this wrestling issue between faith and fear. Faith should always be in our decision making as believers in Christ. If, if we really have confidence in our God, if we really have faith, it should always be in that decision making. And faith, fear should be absolutely absent from the equation. Fear has no place because it is not of the kingdom of God. And at what point are we, born-again believers in Jesus Christ, supposed to be using things of the kingdom of darkness to help us make decisions? There's just no place for it. Now, I will say this. That does not mean that every decision is a good decision. Every risk is a good risk. Our decision-making should be tempered by wisdom, not tempered by fear. Amen. We say that again. Our decision-making should be tempered by wisdom, not tempered by fear. And even as born-again believers in Jesus Christ, we grew up in a world, we grew up in a family system, we, we just grow up in a system that teaches us to temper our decision-making, our boldness, our actions by fear. Well, what, what if I'm rejected? Well, I want to do this, but what, what if they reject me? What if they don't like me? What if I forget my lines? What if I trip? What if I do something foolish? What if... What if what if I've got my shirt untucked and I don't realize it? What if I put my shirt on backwards? There are all these wild things that start to come into our mind. How many times have you had a conversation with somebody, especially like at church, or you've stepped out to share something with somebody and you felt good about it, and five minutes after you left the church, you're on the way home, and something's going, oh, you shouldn't have said that. <laughs> or, I, you know what, they may never speak to you again. You know, they, they sat there and they said, thank you, and, and you're driving away thinking, oh my God. What, what did I do? Fear comes in and fear starts entering in. And, and fear becomes such a prominent, you know, we, we see people, they, they get an idea from the Lord about a song. They get an idea from the Lord about a business. They get an unction from the Lord about stepping out and changing career paths and going to school. But all of a sudden fear comes along. Well, what if I can't pay my bills? If God called you to do it, he'll pay the bills. Amen. 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 If God called you to step out and teach, he'll give you the words to speak. But we, we so often slide back into this place of fear, and that fear is not of God. Now listen, those decisions should always be tempered by wisdom. We have a habit of tempering our decisions by fear, but they should be tempered by wisdom. If you suddenly have a creative idea for a new business, and you say, you know what, I'm going to take all of my life savings, and I'm going to take all of my college savings for my children, and I'm going to borrow as much money as I can, and I am going to invest in flying cars that run on water that are built completely and entirely out of recycled paper. <laughs> it might not be fear that is saying what happens if. That might be wisdom that says, what happens if the water leaks out of the paper fuel tank? <laughs> so, we temper our decisions with wisdom because wisdom is of God. Wisdom is of the Holy Spirit. Wisdom is the Holy Spirit. Wisdom we should love and cherish. It is more precious than jewels and silver and gold. As born-again believers in Jesus Christ, let us temper our decision-making by wisdom, but not by fear. I, I am very confident, based upon personal experience, based upon knowing folks, based on ministering with folks, counseling with folks, discipling with folks, just spending time with folks, that we make far too many decisions. Our life is so very much governed by fear. We don't admit it, and we pretend like it's not. And we don't necessarily think about it. We don't necessarily hold ourselves accountable. We don't necessarily do an inventory. Now again, listen. I, there, if you take a good hard look, I mean, 
If your front door has seven deadbolts on it, and your alarm system has an alarm system, if you've got an alarm system for your alarm system, amen? You know, I, I know it sounds crazy, because I, I know that the world that we live in is dangerous and stuff. You know, I know people that still live in urban communities and nice houses, they don't ever lock their doors. I still know, I mean, multiple people that have nice houses 24-7, they can be out of town. Their front door, their back door is still unlocked. Their houses are not locked up, and, and, and they don't get stuff taken. Now listen, please hear me, okay? The pastor is not suggesting that you leave your front doors unlocked. If you leave your front doors unlocked and all of your stuff is gone, that is your fault, not mine, okay? Your front door has a lock on it, use it. Because there are people with bad motives in the world. But, but we should not be living and operating in fear. Again, wisdom. If God gives you wisdom to protect yourself or to defend yourself or to protect the property that he has given unto you, that is good stewardship and that is wisdom from the Lord. But it's not fear-based. If fear says, well, you know, what if, what if somebody does this and what if somebody does that and I better have this and I better have that and I better do this and I better do that because somebody might this and somebody might that. And those are fear-based decisions as opposed to wisdom that says, you know what, God has given me this and, 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 and I know that there are people who maybe might want to take that away. Sometimes it can be a fine line, but it's still a line and there's still a principle there. And it, and it really is a matter of coming out of it. We, we grow up in it, and we're conditioned in it. I, I speak of firsthand experience, and I speak to you this morning out of an unction and a passion that the Lord has given me as, as a progressive journey that has spanned many, many years, but has particularly come to this, this really place of, of deep healing over the last year, the last six, eight months, where the Lord has just been absolutely breaking me loose at another level of, 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 of fear and fear-based decision-making. You know, this, this, this mindset that we, we grew up with, that hiding behind every tree and hiding behind every bush and hiding behind every decision, is there something waiting to get us? Where's the faith-based decision that says even if there's stuff out there waiting to get us, Everywhere my foot treads, my God is with me. Everywhere I go, His angel armies go with me. Where is the thinking that says, greater is the authority that is in me than the authority that is in this world? Greater is the force and the power of the prayers that I pray, not because of my righteousness, but because of the finished work of Jesus Christ on the cross of Calvary's hill. Because of the covenant promises of His word. Let us live absolutely absent from fear, not because of our courage alone, but because it's a belief that is based upon faith in Christ and not our works. See, that's really kind of the, the whole caveat of this thing. If we come out of a religious background, or if we come out of a, a works-based background, or if we even come out of the world system, the world system that says do good, be rewarded, do bad, be punished. And we step into this whole system of grace that does not compute. We, we are raised by a school system. We are raised by parents. We are raised by a, a, a secular work environment. Everything says that when you do right, you're rewarded. And when you do wrong, you're punished. And we step into this place of grace where God says, I will do this work for you because you can't do it yourself. And then in that place, there is an expectation that our love and gratitude, our thankfulness, our adoration, our worship becomes so overwhelming that we become these living testimonies, these living sacrifices declaring His glory. Not that our lives become righteous so that we can receive a reward, but that that righteousness is produced out of gratitude that we earnestly desire for holiness to honor a God who has honored us when we were holy and completely undeserving. Right. Let us live a life that is pleasing and acceptable and holy unto God, not because we fear Him, but because we adore Him. Amen. Ooh, 
Did you hear yes. that? Even much of our Christian faith is born out of fear rather than adoration. Yes, we are to fear the Lord, but that means a, a reverence and awe. Not a fear that we're, we're wondering, oh, God is out to get me. Let me hide. Let me be concerned that the first misstep I make, that God's going to step out from behind something with a hammer and squish me. God loves us. God is good. Yes, amen. And, and, and He wants to bless us and care for us and provide for us and protect us. He has given His very life for us to redeem our lives out of the miry clay to deliver us, to heal us, to set us free, to fill us with His Spirit, to share that love and that grace and that truth with others. Let us worship Him and honor Him and live rightly as a way of saying, thank you for doing for me and in me what I could not do for myself. Yeah. It is true that for many, even our Christian walk is driven by fear rather than wisdom and God's goodness. And I remind you, the spider crossed the road, obviously to get to the website. <laughs> Fear is not of the Lord, so obviously it is of. And if the very basis of our Christian faith is based on something that is not of God, do I really need to finish that equation? Or does it speak for itself? John Wayne is quoted as saying, life is hard. But it's even harder if you're stupid. <laughs> Life is hard, but it's even harder if you're stupid. Let us not make silly decisions. Decisions that are contrary to what should be obvious and consequently make this life much harder than it needs to be. I, the, the Lord himself did say that, that we would have challenges and in, in situations and circumstances in this life. Mm -hmm. there's, there's no doubt about that. But let us meet those head on. Let us approach those circumstances with wisdom and faith, confronting being more than conquerors, <coughs> being victors, as they say, rather than victims. Let us walk in unashamed faith and boldness. Romans chapter 8, verse 15 in the King James says that we have not received the spirit of bondage again to fear, but we have received the spirit of adoption, mm -hmm. whereby we cry, Abba, Father. Father God, personal, <coughs> Daddy God, some would translate. It, it, it really, even Daddy is not an adequate translation. It is an extremely intimate, endearing term, this Abba. Notice what the scripture says. We have not received the spirit of bondage again, again to fear. We have been delivered from fear. We were in the kingdom of darkness. We were bound by fear. But when we came out of that kingdom, we were supposed to leave fear there. Fear was not something we were supposed to put back on in the kingdom of Christ. The New Living Translation says it this way. So, so you have not received a spirit that makes you fearful slaves. Instead, you received God's Spirit when He adopted you as His own children. Now we call Him Abba, Father. He hasn't created us to be fearful slaves, but to be adoring children, sons and daughters who adore our Father. I don't know if you've ever seen a, a, a child that fears their parent. Have you ever been in a store or in a marketplace and seen a child that just absolutely fears their parent? It grieves your heart. Yet we see Christians running around proclaiming God is good, but they fear Him instead of trusting Him. If we really understand how good He is, Hallelujah. Hallelujah indeed. Praise God. Amen. <clears throat> this is so absolutely fundamental. It's interesting. We just keep coming back to the beginning of the book of Genesis. 
it seems wherever we're at, wherever we're at in the messages, wherever we're at in the worship, we just keep coming back to the beginning of Genesis. It says in the third chapter of Genesis, in the tenth verse, And Adam said, I heard thy voice in the garden, and I was afraid, because I was uncovered, I was naked, I was exposed, and I hid myself. I heard thy voice, Lord, and I was afraid. How many times prior to that, all the times that Adam and Eve walked in the garden with God, all of those first chapters of creation and all the interaction that God had, never once do we have an account of Adam saying, well, God, I was afraid if I gave it the wrong name, you would squish me. I was afraid, God, if I called the giraffe a rhino, that you would get angry. We never hear Adam expressing, I was afraid before the fall. Before Adam and Eve partook of the forbidden fruit, before they partook of the tree which God commanded them not to partake of, before they partook of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, they already had complete and total revelation of good. There was nothing good for them to gain. They had absolutely everything that there was to have before God. Notice in Genesis 2.25 it says, Both Adam and Eve were uncovered, they were naked. Literally, Adam and Eve, by that, that naked uncovered, our mind immediately goes to the physical being. But what that means is that they were completely exposed. There was nothing concealed or hidden. There was nothing in their heart, nothing in their mind, nothing in their past, nothing in their present that was concealed from God or anyone else, and they had no shame. They were not ashamed in any way, shape, or form. There is not a person in this room, myself included, there is not a person who is listening to this recording on the internet or anywhere else that does not have something that has happened in your life that has the potential to cause you shame. You have thought things, done things, we have said things that, 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 that we wish that we hadn't. There is not one of us that would want to stand here on this platform and recount every single detail of our life before our peers. Not one of us. Because every one of us would run and hide. Adam and Eve stood before God and all of creation. And everything in their life was completely and totally revealed, exposed. And there was no shame in them. Because they had not partaken of the tree of the knowledge of evil and shame, guilt and fear. There was no fear in their life. We were created by God, to walk with God with absolutely no fear. Completely and totally absent of fear. Fear did not exist in their lives, and as born-again believers in Jesus Christ, redeemed to that pre-Adamic fall state, there should be no fear in our lives. Praise God. Hallelujah. Amen. I, I, perhaps you didn't hear that. Let me say it again. Amen. There should be no fear in our lives Amen. as born-again believers who Amen. truly trust Hallelujah. in the most Praise supreme God. authority in Hallelujah. all of creation and yes. believe that He is behind us, yes. believe that He is with us, Amen. believe that He is Amen. for us. Praise God. Hallelujah. Yes. Thank you, Lord. Thank you. Hallelujah. Thank you. Yes. Yet the moment they partook of that tree of the knowledge of evil and fear and disease and death and sickness, Adam's response was, I heard your voice, God, and I hid. I was afraid of my salvation. I was afraid of my Savior. I was afraid of the one good source of life and all of creation. What a lie perpetrated by the enemy. The one source of life is the one that Adam feared. Didn't fear the serpent. Mm -hmm. Oh, God, stupid. He didn't seem to fear his wife at that point. The only thing he feared was the one true God, the only one he should not. Amen. 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 His source of life and help. Matthew chapter 10, verse 28. The Lord says, Fear not them which kill the body, but are not able to kill the soul. Rather, fear, meaning reverence him which is able to destroy both soul and body in hell. We should fear no man. Death should hold no grip on us. I know that's a bizarre statement to make. But as born-again believers, we should have absolutely no fear of death. Amen? 
Now, I'm not suggesting you go bungee jumping without double checking the cords. <laughs> Again, wisdom should temper every decision. But we should not be making decisions based upon the fear of dying. Mm -hmm. And we make so many decisions. Take a look in your mailbox sometime soon. Watch your TV. How many pieces of marketing come into your lives that play on your fear of death? Mm -hmm. How much of our economy is built around playing on people's fear of death? Hmm. You're going to probably ruin your day, but none of us is going to live forever in this body on this earth. That's right. Hallelujah. Hallelujah, That's right? right? <laughs> Especially some of you, that body's starting to sag or it's starting to swell or it's getting lumpy or bumpy or spotted or whatever. The hair's falling out of it and it's growing in other places it never used to grow. And you're thinking, well, Lord, it's about time to refine this thing. Lord, have mercy. Wisdom, stewardship. Should we take care of this body? Absolutely. It's a gift from God. Should we take care of this life? Absolutely. It's a gift from God. And, and I'm pretty certain, based upon the scriptures, that if we leave this earth, it's very hard for us to evangelize in this earth. And we have work to do. So we shouldn't devalue our lives. We shouldn't take unnecessary risk. We shouldn't do foolish things. As John Wayne said, life is hard. It's even harder when you're stupid. Make stupid decisions. Let us use wisdom in reasonably good stewardship, let us do the things that God would have us do to protect and preserve the life and the opportunity and the resources that He's given us. But let us not make fear-based decisions. Hebrews 13, 5 and 6 says, Let our conversation be without covetousness, and be content with such things as we have. For he has said, I will never leave thee nor forsake thee, so that we may boldly say, The Lord is my helper, and I will not fear what man shall do unto me. It, it, it really is pretty amazing when you start reading the scripture how many times God tells us not to fear. And yet we tend to walk around in fear. Uh, you can rationalize however you want, but the reality of the matter is that's a violation of scripture. It's a violation of God's Word. I like the way the New Living Translation says that in Hebrews 13. Don't love money. Well, that'll preach right there, huh? <laughs> Don't love money. Be satisfied with what you have. Don't love money. Be satisfied with what you have. For God has said, I will never fail you, nor abandon you. Amen. How many other pieces of mail and marketing come across your TV and come into your mailbox that, that, that speak to your fear of financial security, your fear of financial loss. God says, don't worry about that. Set, set your focus on me. Focus on my kingdom and my righteousness. All these other things I'll take care of for you. Yet how, how, how many lay awake at night worrying about money and worrying about the bills? How many stand in church and say, God is good, God provides, and then don't sleep at night? <laughs> Remember we talked about kidding ourselves, saying what we know, but the peace is not actually there in our heart. You see, the, the, the fruit is not manifested so much in what we speak, it's what's in our heart. If our heart is at peace, yeah, world, Lord, I, the, 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 Lord, the world seems to be coming unglued. The bank account seems to be empty, the bills seem to be piling up, and I don't know how, and I haven't worked, and I don't have this, and I don't have that, and people say, and, and, and I don't... But I'm at peace and sleeping like a baby. You're trusting God in that place. I think that's why they call it the peace that passes all understanding. Because if you can understand it, if it makes sense, it's probably not the peace of God. Because the peace of God is the peace that passes all understanding. It makes no sense. People should be able to look at you and go, you're nuts. All the stuff's going on around you and you just seem chill. You're at peace. What's wrong with you? That's when you know you're really trusting God, is when people start to look at you and go, what's wrong with you? If nobody's ever said to you recently, what's wrong with you? Maybe you're not really stepping out in faith. 
Maybe you still look a little too much like the world. Somebody at some place should think you're nuts. <laughs> Around here, we're pretty good shape. We got a lot of those folks. So. <laughs> we're good. A lot of folks think we're nuts, and we're okay with that. We're a peculiar people, and, and we have no problems with that. <laughs> First Peter chapter 3, verses 13 and 14. Who is he that will harm you if you be followers of that which is good? But if ye suffer for righteousness' sake, happy are ye. Be not afraid of their terror, nor be troubled. This is New Testament stuff, gang. This is not Old Testament something that people try to explain away. The New Living Translation says it this way. Now who will want to harm you if you are eager to do good? But even if you suffer for doing what is right, God will reward you for it. So don't worry or be afraid of their threats. God will take care of it. God will bless you. Stop watching three hours of Fox News before you go to bed and laying awake all night thinking the world's coming unglued. God's got it. He's got it. Satan was thoroughly convinced on Calvary's Hill that he won. Played right into God's hand, didn't he? Oops. Played right into God's hand. God turns every situation, if we will allow Him, to good for those who love Him and are called according to His purpose. So how do I know if I'm called according to His purpose? Fail-safe test, okay? Just, just do me a favor. Just put your hand here and go. <sighs> if you felt something on the back of your hand or the front of your hand when you went, <sighs> that means you're called. If you have breath in your body, you're called. Yeah. Amen. If you have breath in your body, you are called by God. Yeah. So now the question is, do you love him? Because if you love him, he's going to turn it for good. Hallelujah. Well, he may not do it in your timing. He may not do it according to your schedule or according to the program that you diagram for. Come on. Come on. Amen. Some of us have sent God some flow charts that he just has not followed. <laughs> we spent hours working that baby up full color, put some animations in there, a little sound for background, set it off. It's almost like he didn't watch it. <laughs> First John chapter 4, verse 18. Very, very familiar passage. And this is where we'll conclude today. It says simply this in the King James. There is no fear in love. But perfect love casts out all fear because yes, fear hath amen. torment. Amen. He that Hallelujah. feareth is not made perfect in love. Yes. Never hear one of those great religious words, made perfect doesn't mean that we're perfect. We never sin again. It just means that we're made complete. When, when, when we're completed in faith, in love, meaning Him. When, when, when the love of God, God is love. When, when God comes to dwell in here and there's a fullness of the manifestation, a completeness of the revelation of how good He really is. That's really, and I know I'm paraphrasing and I'm, and I'm generalizing, but it's really what the scripture is saying. When we have, really have a revelation of the goodness of God that becomes a rhema, a living revelation inside of us of how good He is, yes, Lord. we're not going to fear anything. Amen. We're just not going to fear the news, the banker, the doctor, mm -hmm. or even the person sitting next to us. The New Living Translation says it this way, Such love has no fear because perfect love expels all fear. Let us remember at this moment that fear is the opposite of love. I know traditionally we think or we've been taught that hate is the opposite of love. Hate is not the opposite of love. Hate is the symptom of fear. People hate because they fear. Hate is a symptom. Fear is the root. The opposite of love is fear. Perfect. It doesn't, the Bible doesn't say that perfect love casts out all hate. The Bible says perfect love casts out all fear. Amen. People hate because they fear. They, they fear that actually someone is better than them. They fear that somebody's going to take something away from them. They fear that somebody's going to reject them, that somebody has something that they don't have, that, that, that this, that, the other, that they're going to lose something. They fear the unknown. 
people fear the unknown, so they hate the unknown. I, 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 don't, I, don't, I don't understand that culture. I don't understand people that live that way. I don't understand them, so I hate them. They build walls. They build prejudice, foolishness. Such love has no fear, because perfect love expels all fear. If we are afraid, it is for fear of punishment, and this shows that we have not fully experienced His perfect love. If we are still fearing, walking around in fear, it means that we haven't fully understood the goodness and the love of God. And it really is that simple. This is such a simple accountability test today. It's a test we don't like because many of us still have fear, and we want to believe that we really understand and know how good God is. We want to believe that we really believe how much God loves us. And we even profess that we know how good God is and how much He loves us, yet the litmus test says we still have fear in our lives, which means the Word of God says we still don't yet know. There's still learning for us to do. Either that, or the Word of God is not really completely true, or it's not really completely relevant, or some other silliness. Such love has no fear, because perfect love expels all fear. If we are afraid, it is for fear of punishment, and this shows that we've not fully understood, experienced the, 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 the perfect and complete knowledge of the Lord Jesus Christ. I want to read it to you now in the message. We're actually going to read 17 and 18. And this is, this is really kind of a global summation of what we've discussed today in two simple verses. I, I know that the message is a paraphrase. It's okay. Nobody's going to hell just because we read the message Bible today. It's all right. It's just a paraphrase. It's just expressing God's heart in a different language, in a different way. God is love. When we take up permanent residence in a life of love, we live in God and God lives in us. This way, love has the run of the house. It becomes at home and mature in us so that we're free of worry on Judgment Day. Our standing in the world is identical with Christ. There is no room in love for fear. Well-formed love banishes fear. Since fear is crippling, a fearful life, a fear of death, a fear of judgment, is a life that's not yet fully formed in love. Those are remarkably powerful words. I'm going to reread that last part again, and, 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 and we'll let that sink in. Our standing in the world is identical with Christ. There is no room in love for fear. Well-formed love banishes fear, since fear is crippling. Look at your neighbor and say, fear is crippling. Fear is crippling. Stay away from it. Fear is crippling. Banish it from our lives. Let us banish it from our ministry. Let us banish it from our decision-making. Fear cripples our decision-making. Fear cripples our witness. Critness, fear cripples our evangelism. Fear cripples our giving. <clears throat> you ever got an impulse from God to send money somewhere to feed some people? To send money somewhere to give people some water? To send money somewhere to, 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 to fund Bibles or to fund a church? And, and you've had a sudden unction and you've thought, no, that was just a ridiculous impulse because I can't even pay my bill just made a fear-based decision not to trust God who gave us all the money to start with that he'll send more if we send it where he said. We just missed an opportunity because we were crippled by fear. Crippled. Fear is crippling. A fearful life, a life that fe fears death, that is fear of judgment, is not one yet fully formed in God. But let us allow love, to have the run of the house. The only thing I would change here is I would say, I wish they changed it to say a run of the temple. Amen? Let fear run rampant in this temple. Let it just own the place. Let us be absolutely free of worry on judgment day. 
For our standing in the world is identical with Christ. Amen. As he is in this world, so are we. Amen. Says the King James. As Christ is in this world, so are we. I do not recall any decision of Christ made based in fear. The crowds, the multitudes, they came. They thronged about him to take him. And to take him contrary to his timing and his plans. And what did he do? He walked right through the midst of the crowd and went on about his business. <laughs> the IRS calls. Do you all of a sudden forget your Christian faith and reassess all your priorities and go back to work and leave church? Or do you say, my God is bigger than the IRS? Power bill's late. Do you panic? One more little litmus test and we're done. Think about our prayer life. You know, if you listen to the lives of most Christians, it would probably be fear-based prayer. Again, the spider obviously crossed the road to get to his website. It's pretty obvious, his website. Fear is not of God, so it must be of someplace else. Yet we build our prayer life to God on fear, which is not of God. Oh God, please don't let this happen. Oh God, please don't let that happen. Oh God, please keep us from this. Oh God, please keep us from that. Where is the prayer life that says, thank you, Lord, that you are good? Amen. Thank you, Lord, for keeping us from this. Thank you, Lord, for keeping us from that. We praise you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Now, listen, I'm not saying we don't pray covering, but let's... let's Pray prayers of faith rather than Amen. prayers of fear. Let's yes. pray prayers of completed love yes. and expectation of God's goodness in all things at all times.